All right. All right, well, welcome to Science Fair. Um, as you can see, this year at Nauticon, we brought the entire Nomad clan. Um, we hope to take you on a journey that our family has gone through and um, really dive into science, and you'll find out why we put fair in quotes. So I'll start off. Um, I'm the father of the Ghost Nomad clan, or I'm Ghost Nomad, father of the Nomad clan. I'm an InfoSec guy. I've been doing InfoSec for about three years. Um, I'm a geek, I'm a gamer, obviously I'm a dad and a husband, um, and I just like to dabble in all sorts of things and watch how my kids learn. So next, my wife. Um, hi, I'm Amy, or otherwise known as Frontal Lobe. I am um, a school neuropsychologist that works for uh, an urban district here in Northeast Ohio, um, really working with um, our curriculum and our assessment departments, kind of leading that up. Um, and just, I learn a lot about technology and all of that from my kids and try to incorporate that into just what we're doing every day. Hi, I'm uh, Ghost Nomad Junior, and I'm in seventh grade. I like to um, do science. I'm a second degree, almost third degree in Taekwondo, my third degree black belt. And I do um, saxophone for my band, and I like to play video games. Hi, I'm Knuckles. I like to play soccer. I'm a hardcore gamer. I do piano, and I used to do guitar. I'm in fourth grade, so. Micro Nomad? Um, Over here. Um, I'm Micro Nomad. I'm Micro Nomad. Um, I do gymnastics all, um, on Friday. Do you like to play the computer? Yes, I like to play the computer. What grade are you in? I'm in second grade. Cool. And then Little Lobe. <laughs> oh, say hi. Hi, I'm Little Lobe. <laughs> what grade are you in? Kindergarten. Kindergarten. And what sports do you like to do? Soccer, basketball, and baseball. Mm -hmm. I go to gymnastics mm -hmm. every, every, every Friday. Friday. All right. So that's the Nomad Clan, as you can see. Some of us are still a little shy. <laughs> Some of us are more comfortable and have been to Nauticon for a couple of years. So we want to kind of take you on this journey about science because I think uh, when I was growing up, at least in school, science was just, you know, biology, chemistry, and same with, with frontal lobe, biology, chemistry. And it didn't always seem like there was a fun way to get involved. And for me, I was terrible in, in scientific math now frontal lobe is good with math, so of course when it comes to homework, but it just never felt fun. And so as we've been getting ready, you know, to have our kids go through these different um, progressions of science, it's trying to find how it's fun. And so last year, I tweeted this out on Twitter, my kids heck your kids science fair project. And what this came out of was Ghost Nomad Junior, um, the school that they go to, requires all 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, so all middle school, to participate in the local science fair. And so he had an opportunity to develop an idea and go through the scientific method and be judged. And so would you like to kind of talk about your experience with science fair a little? Yep. And for my um, science fair, I wanted to make sure that it was something I'd like to do and not just something that I was kind of forced to do. I wanted to kind of have fun with it because I really did like science classes. I found them very interesting. And so I wanted to do something with power because that kind of interested me. And so I did which creates more power, um, solar panels or water wheels in a certain amount of time. And I went through all this. I used the scientific method to kind of go through it. And I really found it fun, you know, looking up all the information. And I used an Arduino to kind of get all the data. And I found that fun as well, having to solder it all together and program everything so it would work. Yeah. And so you went to the regional science fair. Yep, I made some regionals and got a pretty good score there. Got two superiors. And I went to state science fair and got a perfect score there. So. You got two perfect scores. And one of the things that the judges mentioned, and the reason 
I, I came up with this tweet, was the judges, uh, both at the state science fair level and, and even in the, in the um, instruction to the judges, was that he used the Arduino. And if you walked around and looked at some of the other projects that looked at power, they used a voltometer. You know, they took measurements maybe every 15 minutes. And so they probably gathered, you know, a couple, maybe 100 points of data. I think in the seven days that we ran it, we gathered, what, 66,000 points of data? Yeah, many pages of data. Because we had it collecting every 30 seconds. Uh, so that's why we hacked the other kids' science fair project, because using that Arduino, it gathered all the data. Now this year, of course, last year you were in, in classes, but this year you got to go to regionals. And right, so we kind of saw the same, um, we had the same kind of experience. Isaac built on, or I'm sorry, go Snowman Jr. <laughs> <laughs> um, built on his science fair um, project from last year to this year and added another element, which was wind power. So we had this third um, element that was added to it. And again, we kind of walked around and were able to look at all of those science fair projects. A lot of them, you know, kind of looking at how much energy is created by these different um, elements and different and models. And still, we were noticing that it was like, um, our, the students that were involved in it had not taken it to that next level. They weren't using all of the technology that's available to them, using things like Arduinos. They were still very much um, you know, relying on those voltometers and, and other methods that just really we've moved beyond, but maybe not the experience in our schools has allowed us to recognize that we've moved beyond. And probably just a point of note, Ghost Nomad Jr. came up with all of this on his own. The only contribution I made, other than helping him kind of put the pieces together, was to say, well, have you thought about using an Arduino? But he went out and found the code online. He did all this stuff. So, you know, a lot of times you, you look at the science fair projects and you say, oh, you can tell the parents made this or, or that. But it was really important for us that he knew exactly what he was doing so that when he got asked questions, he could explain it. And at the state science fair level, they, they really stressed kind of where we're going to go next, but they really stressed the scientific method. Not necessarily that the kids came up with something so inventive that it's going to change the world, but did they follow the scientific method? I thought that was really cool as a parent to see, because that's going to help me going forward with the rest of our kids, um, is that you, know, you don't have to come up with something that, that, that's groundbreaking. I know the guy, uh, one of the uh, RSA speakers this year was, uh, when he was 14 or 15, he went to a science fair and had fusion. You know, my kids aren't going to do fusion, most likely, and, and he went on to meet, create this multi-million dollar company that's selling um, um, shoot, radiation detectors. You know, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But at least I know that what's important at this level is the scientific method. Um, and then the second component to this is something new this year, um, and you'll see it in the middle of the table, was um, Joseph Mad Jr. had an opportunity to do Science Olympiad. And so, can you kind of talk about what the project was? Yeah, so the project was to make an instrument that could do different scales in a musical scale and to play a certain amount of songs, one that you chose and one that was given. And so I spent a lot of time kind of working out which instrument I wanted and kind of going through, you know, how the vibrations work and how to get the sound out. <laughs> I'll follow there. Um, yeah, and so and what was cool is that we started looking online yeah, how do you make a, he had to do a string instrument. So how do you make a string instrument? And there was all these complicated, where you got to cut the wood and bend it and put it in water. And, you know, people were making these complex, real acoustic guitars. And I found a guy on YouTube who makes cigar box guitars. And he's like, you can do it in under an hour. And I mean, we literally built it in under an hour. Yep. And it cost like nine bucks in parts. And that's mostly the screws. Do you want to strum it real quick just to show yeah. that it works? Yeah, it wanted to come over by the So okay. yeah. So it's pretty cool. And his um his partner at the Science Olympiad built um a xylophone out of, of bottles and, and set the water to different levels. So it was it's been a really neat experience. I think it's kind of inspired these guys. As you can see, a uh, little low has a little experiment she's put together. Right? What have you done there? I made, I made, a, I made a clock that goes with these, these, these. You made a lemon clock? 
a lemon clock. Yeah. That makes a lemon go to the electricity. And what did you say you wanted to do for science fair? Make a robot talk. She wants to make a robot talk. I know yeah. Knuckles. Yeah, he inspired me to think of what I want to do, and I said I want to see um, if food acids could provide more energy than a solar panel could by measuring in volts. Right, so a, bio, a biofuel versus a... And, and Micronomad, have you been inspired about science fair? No, not really. <laughs> That's okay. You'll still have to do it because <laughs> this school requires it. But yeah, so that was kind of the, the crux of this My Kids, Heck Your Kids Science Fair project is that, you know, you got to, they're starting to think beyond. And a lot of that came from Nauticon. Um, I know five years ago I gave a talk on haiku. And then the next year, Ghost Nomad Jr. wanted to come with me. So we gave a talk on, on um, called One Bag Cookie. And then that want made Knuckles want to come to Nauticon. So he came two years ago, and we did a, a talk on securing the classroom. And then last year, Micro Nomad wanted to come. So we gave a talk on how Minecraft is, has a lot of security um, aspects to it. And then, of course, Little Loeb was like, well, when do I get to go to Nauticon? <laughs> right? And, and just the soldering, you know, out in the hacker space and the lock picking and Artemis. I mean, it, a lot of these things that you might not think about it really have an impact on, on the way that kids want to get involved in science. All right, so I want to kind of talk, we're going to talk about the scientific method, because like I said, at the state level for science fair, they said this was really important. Um, and so there's the five parts of the scientific method. And, and obviously, when you do an experiment, you have to, to keep these in mind. But Frontal Loeb had some great thoughts on this the scientific method in real life. Yeah, so oftentimes in schools, you know, we sit and we teach the scientific method, you know, step one, step two, and kind of go through those steps. Um, but unfortunately, it happens in isolation. It doesn't always happen within kind of real world context. It's very much set aside as a time during the day where we go through it. It's one lesson or unit that may, may occur over time. Uh, but then you step out of that science classroom and in many of our classrooms across the country, we don't kind of incorporate this scientific method into all the work that we're doing all the time. Even though, you know, as, we're, as kids are learning and as we as adults are learning, we often always start with that question, right? When you want to learn something, you're, it, it usually is stemmed by that question. And we have to go out and actually kind of do some of that research and find out what's behind the questions that we have going on throughout our mind and kind of come up with what is going to be the hypothesis and what we expect to happen. Um, but in schools, we don't always, we do so in some cases, but we don't always take that opportunity to apply the scientific method to everyday learning. Um, it's very rare to find that when you're sitting down and looking at a piece of literature in a classroom to talk about what do you expect to happen at the end of this? Um, you know, what do you think is going to happen with the characters? Let's talk about other research that's out there maybe to support what we're learning about. And so we found it very strong and um, have a very strong belief as parents that we need to really incorporate just this idea of the scientific method behind all of their coursework and all of their everyday kind of life experiences. Because ultimately, when they become adults and they have jobs, and they're taking care of their mom and dad, that they'll be able to have those great jobs that are going to rely on them you know, to use this method and to kind of start thinking outside of the box and gathering that evidence and then applying the data that they find. Very true. Very true. Yeah, so it's, so it's really important um, you know, that you don't just look at this as, OK, I have a science for a project. I want to do this. It's, it's something that you can incorporate as a parent, as a um, aunt or uncle, as a mentor to somebody. You know, you don't have to just have kids to, to help people realize this in everyday life. It's a good, it's a good um, model, just as general, to help other people. And along the lines of what Frontal Lobe said, I found this great quote by William Wewell. I think that's how you pronounce it. He was a, he was a scientist um, attributed a lot with around the scientific method theories. But what was significant about William Wewell was that at a time when people were focusing on a specific type of science, he was still focused on all science. He wanted to know about everything, and not only about science, but he was also a theologian, 
and a minister. So he really tried to incorporate all aspects of science, not just science, but of life in general. And he said invention, sagacity, and if you're not sure sagacity, that comes from the word sage, so wisdom, and genius are required at every step. It's not enough to base scientific method on experience alone. I like this part where he says steps are needed ranging from our experience to our imagination. So again, it's not just following the steps. It's being able to branch out and think and, and go beyond what you've just been taught. So I thought that was a great quote as far as scientific method and incorporating it in your everyday life. All right, so now we have a brain. And this is frontal lobes. So when we think about kind of this whole idea behind science and using that scientific method, we're lots of times talking, you know, problem solving. And but problem solving really is concentrated in the frontal portion of, of everybody's brain. But what you might not know is that that's not fully developed until you're about 29 or 30. And then it starts to deteriorate about the time you're 40 or 45. So you're, I know, it's depressing, <laughs> right? So your optimum time to actually do some of this problem solving um, really occurs much later in your life. What we have to do then as parents and educators and just uh, teachers and other people that are working with kids is we've got to be able to activate some different regions of their brain in order to help them along with the problem solving process. So by us kind of acting almost as the front part of their brain by asking them specific questions, helping them kind of point them in the right direction to find evidence, um, being able to interpret you know, all the different um, information that comes into them. We're teaching them and helping to activate some of those portions of their brain that might not yet be fully functional. So it's really important for us to always be going back to that scientific method and kind of highlighting different aspects of it because their brains alone are not going to be able to do that. And the more that we practice it, the better we'll be when we're like 50, 55. We'll keep those things fresh. We also really want to think about this brain. It r reminds me that you know science and the scientific method, again, is not just your physics, chemistry, biology. It's also your behavioral sciences. You know, science occurs um, also in in music and in sports and, and all activities that kids do and all those different portions of science embedded throughout all of our lives, again, are activating different regions of our brains that are just going to make us more fluent in our ability to do problem solving. And when you talk about behavioral sciences, especially if you're in security, when we talk about social engineering, you're looking at probably, in our family, the four best social engineers. You know, you work with a kid and they don't stop. I mean, it's like, uh, the other day, goes to my junior needed to check something, his homework online. He's like, well, what's the password to the account? Nice try. And then he's like, well, you know, mommy left, and, and I had to look it up, and she wasn't here. Why don't you just give me the password? Like, you know, if you really want to study social engineering techniques, start talking to a kid, because they're really going to teach you a lot. And so those behavioral sciences are, are a great place, you know, like I said, if you want to be a, an expert social engineer, Work with a kid, especially the young ones, because. <laughs> and the other funny part of this is, as, as Frontal Lobe said, she's, she's a school neuropsych. And she took classes last year, to, or two years ago, actually. Four. Right? Four years, wow, it's been a while. <laughs> um, to get that, that neuropsych. Um, um, and so she came home and she would talk about you know, what she learned in class, and then I helped quiz her. And so, of course, the kids, because they're around you at the dinner table in the house, they're going to hear what you're saying. And Knuckles went into class one day, and the teacher was saying how one of the kids fell and hit their head. What did you tell the teacher? Oh, I was like, um, that they hit their, they frontal, hit their lobe. frontal lobe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the kids pick this stuff up. It's, it's really cool. All right. Well, you can't see all of it. But on the one side, it says, take a break. And on the other says, I'm doing science. So, as you notice, all my kids said they like gaming. I'm not sure if, if Little Lobe said it or not, but she likes gaming just as much. And in our house, the biggest game that my kids play, and I play, because um, I'm the biggest kid, is Minecraft. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep, I mean, so what's cool about Minecraft, and I, if you've seen me talk before, I've said it. If you saw our talk last year, you know, I, like I said, we did a talk on Minecraft and security. Minecraft isn't just a game. 
Sure, you can go in and you can play it like a game. You could say, well, it's, it's a game about design, so you can go in and build stuff and, and recreate things. That's a cool aspect of Minecraft. Then you can get into some more of the details of Minecraft, like redstone, which is basically wiring. Yeah. Teaches kids. Yep, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, so you can build circuits with redstone that do all sorts of things. And then you have to figure out, well, I'm using a switch that keeps the power on. Or I'm using a button. Well, that only sends a pulse. Well, what if I have two switches? Well, then you get into your basic logic things. Ands, ors, nans, nors, xors, all those types of things. So the kids get online. They look up in videos. They learn how to build these circuits. But then you can get even more in-depth in Minecraft. And there's special mods. One of them that we've played in our house is Tech It, right? So you can build factories. You can set up piping. And you have to learn, well, if this thing comes in the left side and this thing comes in the right side, right? Yep. It, it functions differently. But what's, what's really cool about Minecraft is, is the next phase when it just goes beyond the game. So what are some of the things that you guys wanted to do with Minecraft? Well, I kind of wanted to make it so that I could control what I did in it and control what I wanted to play on it. And so it kind of led into building a Minecraft server, almost. And, you know, putting in plugins that I want to put in to control certain things, like, oh, I want to not lose hunger, I'll put this plugin in here. I have to go out and find the URL and w get it inside the console so I can get all these plugins inside of it. Right, so being a security person, of course, the first thing they want to do is set up a Windows server. What did I say? Did I got, let you guys put up a Windows server no. on your laptops? No. no. <laughs> what, did I, what did we do? How did we build the server? We built it on the um, Oracle, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, virtual, virtual, virtual Box. Virtual Box. That's what it was. Right. So do, you guys, do all you guys have Virtual Box on your computers? Yeah. Yep. Yeah? You all you guys, what, what operating system um, are you running? Ubuntu. Ubuntu Linux? Yeah? Yeah, Ubuntu Linux. So what's what's cool about it is that, like you, like they said, they wanted to run their own server. So now, my kids know how to run a, a Linux server. You know, maybe not as much as the guy who gets paid at the company, but enough to run it. I mean, they can start up the, the virtual box. They can get the server running. They log in. They can start Minecraft. They know they know about a shell command. They know how to use wget. They use um, nano to edit the the YAML files. I mean, but then it goes beyond that, right? Like, so we started playing all these mini mini games that you can connect to in Minecraft. So what do you, what do you want to do next after you decide you want to run your own server? Well, I wanted to implement like a lot of mini games because I wanted to make a mini game server. Mm -hmm. So first, I went online and I started looking up mini games for Minecraft. Yep. And then you told me to go look on Bucket, which mm -hmm. is a uh, website that you can get plugins for Minecraft. It's a repository for Minecraft plugins. Um, and I started looking at mini games and I found like all these different games and then you taught me how to get them mm -hmm. on my server. So then I started getting them and just building their like things like if they needed an arena I would build that and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And then what, so, so you did that and then you've decided that some of the plugins don't do, do what you want them to do so What's that inspired you to want to do? Well, um, I, oh. I kind of wanted to, okay. you know, yeah. change certain things I didn't like about some plugin. Like, this plugin does this, but I kind of wanted to do kind of half of that, but not fully off and fully on. And so I started to dig deeper into the files and start changing things and start almost writing other plugins to kind of do certain things for other plugins. And what are the plugins written in? Um, Java. Java, right. Which I kind of did the same thing like with Ghost and Nomad Jr. I started taking the plugins and using them to make my own games. Right, so we've installed in Eclipse on their laptops, and they're going through the steps to learn how to pull code down off of GitHub, right? So if I would have sat down, if I would have sat down, or if you sit down with anyone, even when I was a kid, and said, okay, I'm going to teach you how to install a Linux server. <laughs> exactly, right? Or I'm going to teach you how to, to run commands on a Linux server, right? Or I'm going to make you learn Java, right? It, it just doesn't happen. But because of this game called Minecraft, they, my kids have wanted to take the next step. And then they take that next step, and then they decide they want to take the next step. So what's really cool about games like a Minecraft is that it, it can 
inspire you to want to do more, even though sometimes we get overly active in Minecraft. Somebody has to say, take a break. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what's really cool. So computer science, again, it's not just biology. It's not just chemistry. There's, you know, the behavioral sciences, and then there's even the computer science aspect. Um, little, little low? Hello. You like Minecraft, right? Yes. Yeah? You want to make your own server someday? You already did. <laughs> so this kind of leads us into exploring your world, right? And so there's a lot of other things besides science that you may not think about. So this is kind of where we're going to talk about different things we do and how then it relates to science. So what's something that you guys do every Friday? Um, gymnastics. Gymnastics. Is there science involved in gymnastics, Little Lobe? Uh, or Micronovan, whichever one? Uh, yes. Yes? What, what type of science is involved in gymnastics? If you jump higher, you, you make science go in you. You make science go in you? <laughs> so you're, 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 you're playing with gravity, aren't you? You're getting on a trampoline, and it lets you do things that you normally couldn't do. Do you do anything with science? Uh, yeah, I play soccer. Soccer? How's, how's soccer have science in it? Well, it uses gravity and gravity. friction and stuff like that. Uh -huh. Like if the ball, which is not going to stop, comes at a thing that's not moving, it's not going to move, mm -hmm. like what would happen, like stuff like right. that. So so what's, what's something that you do in soccer that would have a, a scientific effect? I play goalie. You play goalie? So I'd be stopping the ball a lot. Right. When you play defense, what happens to players that try to run into you? Well, they get, like, run over and stuff like that. Right. So what happens when you have an unstoppable force that meets an immovable object, right? <laughs> and the other things we've talked about is, you know, you're, you're a good soccer player. You might not always be the fastest on the field, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you do? What, what type of science do you use to defeat the faster players? Dy dynamic angle. You use, ang you use geometry, you cut off the angle, right? So, so you have a shorter distance to travel, which means that you don't have to be as fast as the other player. Do you do any science in, in sports? Oh, yeah, I do Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. And when you're breaking boards or concrete slabs, you have to know where to hit it. You know, if you hit it in the corner, it's not going to break the entire thing. you got to hit it right in the middle, so it's going to collapse inside itself. Right, so there's science in, in the breaking, and, and there's also pain in the science, right? <laughs> Yeah, you've wound up with some scrapes on your knuckles from the, from the concrete. But the other cool part of, of the Taekwondo science of breaking is that there's also a, a, a behavioral science in the, in the self-confidence it gives the kids when they break the board. I know we had a, birthday, a, a Taekwondo birthday party a long time ago, and one of his friends came, and she was very timid, and didn't really want to break the boards because she didn't think she could do it. And the way her face lit up when she broke that board was just amazing to see, you know, that that gave her the confidence, like, oh my gosh, I can do it, right? So, so there's, a, there's a physical science, but there's also a, 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 a I just lost the word, a behavioral science yeah. aspect to that. Um, what, else, what other things do we, when we cook, um, is, there, is there science in cooking? Yeah, because there's chemical changes and physical changes. Mm -hmm. Like baking a cake, that would be a chemical change. So you might take something that's a liquid or semi-liquid and put it in the oven and it turns into a solid, right? Mm -hmm. What's another important part of cooking? What do you have to What do you have to do to put something together? You have to follow a recipe, yeah. some instructions, and you know you have to in science if you want to recreate a scientific. Um, Experiment, sometimes you have to follow the instructions, right? So that's really cool. And then um, she's fascinated by her lemon clock. <laughs> um, music, is there, is there, obviously there's music and science because it's part of the Science Olympiad. What were some of the things that, that the scientific part of the science, of putting together that? Remember? Well, the vibrations and sound waves, how sound travels and how it, 
you flex off the certain surfaces. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the effects, like the Doppler effect, that makes sound change because of certain things. Right. And what, what do we have to do when we, a guitar has frets, right? Right. Is there math behind it, or can you just put it anywhere? There's math behind it because you have to know where to strum it, depending on the length of the thing, to make it sound differently. Right. So we, what we had to do to figure out the frets was there's a formula, and it, it's you take the length of the neck and multiply it by 9.479, right? Yep. Something. And so you do that, and each successive is the, the shorter fret length. So there's math behind how you set up a fret. Is there science when you play the piano? Uh, yeah. Because yeah. Of that. You have to hear the sound waves and like know what to play from like um, instructions. So what notes can go together. Yeah. Right, because if you, you put... You can't just play random notes. You have to play like notes that like actually sound good together. Right, so there's there's notes that sound good together and notes that don't. And that's, that's not only the science of sound, that's, again, going back to behavioral science. What, what sounds good to the human ear and how does that make us feel? So, and then you also have to follow the instructions. Now, is it always just about following instructions? Is there experimentation in music? Yeah. What would that be? Do you know? Well, you have to like experiment on like writing a song. Mm -hmm. You have to experiment with the notes, the sound which sounded like good with each other. Right. So again, that goes back to the imagination in that quote that the scientific method just isn't about what you know, but it's about having an imagination and trying things out. Are there things we do a uh, little low? Are there places we go that has science in it? Museums. Museums. That, that has science in them. Mm -hmm. And what about when we explore outside? Does that have science in it? Yes. Micro? Mm -hmm. Yeah? What type of science is out there? Uh, matter. Matter? Is there certain times that we can't go outside? Yes. And what's that caused by? Um, storms. Weather? Um. That's good. It's good. One of the cool things when we were talking about putting together this talk is I was trying to think of the different ways we incorporate science. Again, it's, it's, that's what it's about. And uh, we go to the beach every year, and I like to dig these massive holes. I think last year it was like, what, a 20 by 20 yeah. maze that we dug in the sand. And what happens to those holes, Micro? Um, Do they stay there the whole week? No, the, um, the gravity pulls waves up. Mm -hmm. And then the gravity on the Earth takes it down, and then um, and then it can go up to shore, and then it can cover up the holes. Right. So so the tides come in and wipe away all the work we've done, and we start back the next day. So those are the types of opportunities that we can take as, as parents or mentors or or what have you to take real world scenarios and incorporate what the science is behind it. Is there anything you want to add to that? No. Okay. So yeah, those are those are the different cool ways that you can add science into into real life. I think when we um, you know step back and reflect on science and this whole idea is science fair. You know, of course we have this concept of actually going to a science fair and and making um, our way through that scientific method. But that idea of it being fair. You know, do all kids have the same opportunities to have science as part of their lives? Um, you know. Unfortunately, they don't. And so one thing that we've tried really hard to do is to you know, get as many of um, our kids' friends involved in talking about what is science and how it is in their everyday life. We also have to be real advocates um, for our kids within the schools that they go to, to let them know that there are these opportunities like having a science fair or going to a science Olympiad. We were really surprised when we realized that not every school did something like science fair. Um, or that they um, kind of really honed in only on certain grade levels. I think that if we were able to kind of, you know, design or open our own school, that that science fair experiment would start from the time that they're in kindergarten and go all the way up, and that everybody would have opportunities to work on these um, concepts of science and to get more familiar with science in everyday life. Um, it's really this whole idea of not having science kind of just contained within those four walls of a school, but really kind of breaking out and making that part of just everyday life um, and any ways that we can get 
you know, everybody kind of outside of even our own family involved in it, then that's just better because it's going to make for more productive citizens down the, down the road. And that was something that surprised me at the State Science Fair um, was we went there and, and like Ghost Nobody Jr. said, he got two perfect scores, which would have put him in for super judging to go to, to the National Science Fair. The National Science Fair is only for high school kids. And that, that kind of surprised me at first. It surprised me that regionals were fifth grade. Is it fifth grade or fourth grade? Well, we consider fifth and sixth elementary. Fifth and sixth or so elementary. So I almost didn't even get to go to sixth state. Right. It was so, based on just people not showing up. Right. So it's, it, it kind of surprised me that there wasn't this opportunity to advance even for the younger kids because that experience, as a parent, and, and Frontal will back me up on this, as a parent, the science fair at the regional and state level is very boring. You literally are locked out of a room for three to four hours. They're the ones that get all the exciting stuff, which is good. That's what it should be about. You're just sitting there waiting, right? Um, but it, it, it's, it was so cool, and it was kind of like, wow, this is where it stops. But then, like Frontal Lobe said, when we were looking at um, going to high school and stuff like that, the high school that, that um, our kids will go to doesn't have science fair. But if you go to science fair, three, four, five years, there's different types of scholarships. And there's, what, $4 million in scholarships for the Ohio State Fair this year? Um, you're talking great opportunities for kids, even if they're not all that into science, to still get exposed and to have something that they can put on, you know, that college resume or that job resume to say, hey, you know, I might not have been the next great chemist, but I did this, and it was something cool. And they can get some money to even do that. And and at the high school level, there's even, um, not at the middle school or elementary school, but there's even uh, computer science that's available. So when we started looking at you know, where our um, children are going to go on in, in their schooling, and we recognize that at the high school that we're going to go to, they don't have that opportunity to take place in science fair, we now had to go out and research, well, can you kind of connect with another school, you know, or do, does it have to be... Um, hosted by your own school. And what we were very pleased to discover was that you can actually contact other schools that do the science fair and have um, students from outside of that school kind of come and, and join in their school level science fair to be judged, then move on to the regional level. And nobody at the schools that we worked with or nobody at the regional or state science fair ever told us that. It was something that just one day we were, you know, online kind of looking up some information about science fair, and we discovered that you could do that. Um, you know, luckily I work for a school, so it's going to be easy, right, for me to be able to get my my own kids connected with a school um, that does do science fair. But again, other um, students out there don't have that opportunity, so we really feel like we've got to kind of spread that word. Um, you know, we've got to spread the word about the wealth of information and opportunities there are that are even just on the web for kids to be designing their own experiments and putting that out there for other kinds of local judging and feedback from our own, um, you know, scientific experts out in the field. And also, and this is a great place for us as technologists to look at those hacker space opportunities for and getting kids involved in those. I mean, I know a lot of people that I, I personally haven't had the hacker space experience except for at a conference, but I know a lot of people that, that do that, and that's awesome because when you can connect, not just with your community, but with kids and get them involved early, at, you know, they might not build the robot, but if they can come watch how you do it and kind of tinker around with you, that's a huge, huge you know, step for that kid. It makes a huge difference in the way they look at science. Well, I got to go in and touch the robot. That was really cool. I, I know for, uh, for Micronomad, they brought in a... Um, uh, recycling robot to his classroom and he got to, to see that and that was just something that inspired him. It, it, he and I didn't build it but it was inspiring to see something like that. So just having those opportunities and, and really making sure that you never as a parent or a mentor or an aunt or uncle or whatever involvement you may have that you don't get discouraged and that you keep searching for, for that opportunity. And with that, are there any questions? Sure. Well, uh, it might be slightly unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not the most relevant question, but you guys were talking about uh, using Ubuntu. Have you guys used uh, Edge Ubuntu at all? 
Uh, not not for anything else. Like I said, we've just I've just had them exposed to Ubuntu for running their Minecraft server. But I've I've looked into Ed Ubuntu and, and X Ubuntu and there's I know there's different stuff out there. We've just done what's convenient at that point. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? How willing are the other schools to give information about getting involved in the science fair? Yeah, I have noticed that if you can get the right person to talk to, usually that is going to the head of their curriculum department and then asking if they have somebody specifically in charge of science for the district or for that school and talking to that person, they are absolutely more than willing to have people kind of join into the science fair experience or science Olympiad or whatever it might be. Sure. Had you put mini games on Minecraft servers? Um, yeah, I have. Um, it's kind of complicated. Well, what, are you, what are the steps you would take? Well, first you have to <laughs> first you have to get a server uh -huh. to run, and okay. then you have to find a plugin. I recommend looking on Bucket. It's a really nice website. Um, and then you have to do, you get on your um, server file, and then you do um, CD plugins. Mm -hmm. Change those in the plugins directory. And then you do a command, it's wget http, and then the URL, URL for the plugin. Um, first you have to look up the plugin, then you have to go find the version for your server and you um, hover over the download button and down in the left corner it will save the URL and you just have to copy that um, on it. So you just have to know which mini game you want and then so if you want you know Hunger Games you just get the Hunger Games plugin. Um, some mini games don't have plugins though right? Yeah. They like to keep them secret. <laughs> Can Little Bill please explain the lemon experiment? Well, what I did is I made, I cut a lemon out and made these tiny Two silver sides, two silver ones, and two brown ones. And look what happened. It worked. And what's in the lemon that makes it powered? Do you remember? Uh, nope. The acids. And the acids, right. I was, like, I was thinking the acids were the more Mm -hmm. But this is one that I How do you beg your mom and dad to let you play Minecraft all day? <laughs> you do this. Can I play Minecraft? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 I just do, I just want. Then you wait an hour and then you just do this. Can I play Minecraft? <laughs> And then they say, and then they say yes. Social engineering. Yes, social engineering. With all the diverse interests that we have available to us today, what does it take to channel them away from the computer to actual um, creativity that would get projects like this done? Well, if you know the secret to that, like, let me know, because that certainly is still a struggle in our house. We might be talking here today about all these other opportunities and, and things that we do, but I would say that sometimes that does become quite a challenge to pull them away from their computers and that technology well, and, and do some of these other experiments. But what we have found is that we have to figure out how to incorporate that technology into those everyday experiments, you know, by us um, you know, using a, um, like, a tablet to... Um, look at the pitch 
and, and the intonation of our guitar that we built for Science Olympiad, like that was that connection between technology and building the guitar. So we're trying very hard to incorporate the technology within these everyday experiments because it is very difficult, as you know, we're also plugged in and it's hard to get them to pull away from that. And sometimes it's just, get off the computer, you're gonna do this now. <laughs> well, they tell me I can't pay attention to the music if I don't get off. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I say 200 years. That's usually, that's usually what I do. I just teach time. So, well, only sometimes I just, I just keep, keep my tablet into my bed and play it into the computer. Oh no, we should not let you guys talk. <laughs> <laughs> I just stay up and watch TV on the family all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time, actually. Well, are there any other questions before we kind of close? Right over here. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Well, thanks for letting us kind of share our family with you guys today. This has been a great opportunity for all of us to be here together and kind of do this as a family. So thanks yeah. for coming and listening to us. Thank you.